So today we're here with Akala, polymath, poet, why rapper, you, you author, because then it will be um, lulling you into a full sense of yeah, security to make sorry, the... Really to so now. excited about your book, Natives. Yeah. Um, I read it in basically a single sitting on a train journey. Wow. Um, on a PDF, I was just like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. okay, you did the you did the uni read, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. it was fantastic, oh, and yeah, if you haven't copped it, you really ought to. And I guess the first question that I have for you is: we're facing a really uncertain future, mm, yeah, yeah. climate catastrophe, mm -hmm. Brexit, mm -hmm. uh, increase in conflict as we move towards a more multipolar mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why does it feel so timely for you to take the step back and look to the past of empire? Um, because a lot of Britain's challenges are rooted in a failure to reconcile with, confront, educate about the history of empire. The, the recent Windrush, so-called Windrush scandal was an example of just this. The vast majority of the country are unaware that Caribbeans and South Asians arrived in this country as British citizens, many of them war veterans. In the case of Jamaica, from a territory that had been governed by Britain since before the Act of Union with Scotland. So, sorry, governed by England before there was a Britain, yeah, as a political entity. That's how long England and Jamaica's relationship is. Um, and so the, the idea that we are immigrants, those of us who came from Commonwealth countries, but the hundreds of thousands, in fact, 1.6 million people that came from Ireland and Europe after the war, a part of the white working class is one of these deliberate outcomes of actual ruling class policy. Like, and I'm not saying it to be hyperbolic, I'm saying it because I've looked at the documents and that was part of the programme. They felt that they could make proper Brits of the people that came from, from Europe, even though they did not treat them very, very well. But were very nervous, even at Lee's Labour government, very, very nervous about British citizens of the, of the wrong colour. So they called, at Lee's government referred to the citizens on the Windrush, the literal passengers of the Windrush, as an incursion. These were fee-paying British citizens, many of them war veterans, many of them skilled workers. Um, and so this, this, this failure to reconcile with all of this history, to understand what Britain's role in the world has been and how the rest of the world perceives that role. Um, and what America's role since World War II has been and our, and our role in that and how that is going to affect our lives going forward as the world adjusts to the rise of China, to the return of India as a global power, to the shift of the world economy towards Asia. All of those things are gonna have real world effects for individuals living, living in the UK. I mean, you mentioned Clement Attlee just now, and it's something which appears early on in the book, which is you say that to understand the management of race to this day, whether it's the overstaffed mental hospitals, um, the severe incarceration rates, exclusion rates, etc., mm -hmm. you have to understand how it is we came to be here. Right, yeah. And it's interesting to me that the Attlee government is something which is really held up and valorised by, you know, this iteration of Corbyn's Labour Party. <laughs> Does that fill you with a sense of mistrust or concern? I think, I think people just have to own their class interest. And we have different class interests, even those of us who came from working class backgrounds based on our relationship to the British state historically. So I completely understand why if you are part of what calls itself the white working class, you can romanticise that these government and see only the good things they've done, the building of the NHS. Uh, the building of the welfare state, etc. If you're a Malaysian who was bombed by Atlee's government, your opinion then might be slightly different. If you're a Caribbean who was referred to as an incursion despite paying for yourself to come to your own country, and that government then set in process uh, the, the, the mechanisms by which eventually Caribbeans and Asians would be stripped of their British citizenship, then of course your attitude towards that government is going to be quite different. Um, and so what happens is there can be a norm, a sort of on the left, what is considered the white working class norm. And if you question that, you're dividing the working class or any of this crap. So apparently we're supposed to ignore that at least government called our grandparents an incursion to accommodate you. Because if, if, if we mention that, we're bringing up identity politics, even though our grandparents' citizenship was stripped of them because of their identity, we're supposed to ignore that. Similarly, if a Malaysian says, well, hold on a minute, this, this guy bombed Malaysia to try and keep British control in, in, in that part of the, the world in that same period. Um, and so I think it's just different class interests um, and different relationships to the British state that end up with people having different analyses. There's nothing wrong with people respecting the building of the NHS and, and, and the building of the welfare state, but that does have to come in in context of the history of the British Empire and in the history of where Britain was at, at, at that point. Us becoming a multi-ethnic society was not actually a legacy of the British Empire. It was an accidental legacy of World War II. For the hundreds of years that Britain ruled the Caribbean, it never dreamed of inviting its black Caribbean slaves to live in Britain in any significant numbers. It was only because of the desperation of World War II and needing Caribbeans and Asians and West Africans to fight 
um, that we came to be here. So, for example, when they were recruiting in British West Africa, um, the, the local governments were very concerned about two things, actually. You see this in Frank Ferretti's book, The Silent War. They were concerned that the West Africans should not be given the impression that it was a war for democracy, lest they got the opinion that democracy applied to them after the war, which is exactly what happened. And they were very concerned not to badmouth the Germans too much in case disobedience to one branch of the white race taught them disobedience to another branch. This is, you can read, you can read Frank Ferretti's book. These are quotes directly from Br British colonial governors in that period of the world. So we really underestimate the massive impact World War II had on the racial balance of world power and on the undermining of what was presumed common sense white supremacy up until 1939, really. I mean, it was a tremendous driver of the civil rights movement, which is you send over these black GIs, mm -hmm. they spend years killing blonde-haired, blue-eyed men in the fatherland. They come back and then suddenly they can't... They've got no rights, yeah, yeah exactly. Just, uh, and, they were, and the Western governments were cognizant of that at the time. That's what I'm saying. There's, there's loads of evidence them saying the danger of using colonial troops in Europe. The French got a lot of stick for this during World War I as well. Um, or was it World War II? Let me, let me check that one. But anyway, the French got loads of stick for using colonial troops, Senegalese colonial troops, I think it was actually World War II, um, because of what they feared the racial consequences would be. They wouldn't be obedient when they came back to the colonies. It would undermine what um, colonial governors at the time called white prestige. The other thing they were concerned about, ironically, and this was even true of our grandparents coming here, was that we would see white people at their worst. See, in Jamaica, the only white people we knew, and, and by the way, at their worst is what they said. That's not what I'm saying. The only white people we knew in Jamaica, or our grand great grandparents knew, were aristocracy, right? So obviously they were concerned that when my grandmother came here and they integrated with the white working class, they would realize they'd been fed lies, that actually most white people were poor and most of them were uneducated still in that period. I remember my uncle saying, I'm a comma England, I'm a Campbell, it's a white man, I sweep street. Right? And he couldn't, he couldn't believe that there were white street sweepers. It sounds stupid today. I mean, that was my, one of my favorite moments in the book, actually, yeah. is when you talk about your uncle, yeah, yeah, about five years old, straight off the boat, being like, what do you mean there are poor white yeah, people yeah, here? Yeah. It seemed to me like it was the opposite of that moment in Black Skin's White Mask where Fanon goes to Paris and he discovers his, you know, his blackness. And that for him is the moment where the illusion is shattered. Whereas yeah. you've got this kind of photo negative moment where it's actually upon contact with um, poor whites. Yeah, well, remember a lot of those Caribbeans who could even fill in the forms. I mean, after 300 years of British rule, there was less than 20% literacy in Jamaica. That percentage of Jamaicans that were literate were middle class civil servants. So they come to a country in which the vast majority of the people are working class, are poor and uneducated and find that even though they're black, they are now all of a sudden in contact with white people of whom they are better educated. They've never been in that situation before. They assume that all of the white people in the world live like the ruling class in Jamaica because that's what they'd been fed. Sounds stupid, but there was no TV and there was no internet. And so in a weird way, seeing white working class people was, had the exact effect that the ruling class didn't want it to have. The white prestige was shattered, but also they realized, rah, we've been lied to. Like, this is what they've done to their own people. They've been teaching us for so long. They're so civilized and everything is wonderful and it's the mother country and everybody's rich and wealthy, which is what we were being taught in the, well, what my grandparents were being taught in the Caribbean. Um, and then they realize actually white people at home are quite oppressed, actually. I mean, you're pretty scathing in the book of an anti-racism which is based just on um, black bourgeois yeah. excellence and you mm. do really um, interrogate that kind of way of thinking. Mm. What do you think the potential is right now for a multi-ethnic, anti-racist, class-based movement? Um, I think it depends where in the world you are. I think it would be really arrogant of us to say to black Americans, for example, given the history of white supremacist, racist terrorism in America, lynchings, etc from the white working class, given the history of the banning from unions, etc., for us to go and tell black Americans, you must accept our analysis. No, they must not. They've got to figure out for themselves as black Americans, based on their particular history, what to do next. But the situation for black and brown British people is, is quite different. We were moved into the hoods where white people already lived. And even though there were, was certainly a violent racist reaction, there's nothing that can be compared to lynching in America. And it would be disrespectful to put it in that same category. And in a way now, Broadwater Farm or Stonebridge or, or, or Toxteff, these are, these are multi-ethnic working class neighborhoods. Whether or not that's gonna translate into a multi-ethnic political struggle, I don't know, because I think a lot of, um, um, Marx warns against this himself, and I'm not even sure I would consider myself, bam, a Marxist. That's how I would define myself. A lot of people might be surprised by that. Um, but Marx himself warned against it, this sort of idealization of the working class, this, this idea that the passions that middle class analysts or people as intelligent as Marx himself see and have the time to sit down and write about, that 
I felt from within that class itself. I don't think, you know, when I was growing up, most of my brethren were not talking about seizing the means of production. That's the truth. They were talking about how can I pay my rent and keep my gas on and, 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 and how can I create a situation where my kids don't have to choose between, you know, gas and electric every winter and, and you know, maybe I have some half decent clothes. Those were the things that were concerning poor people. So I also am conscious of those of us who have become politicized have to be very careful that we don't impose our wishes onto people that are maybe are growing up the way we might have grown up. Now our lives have become a little bit better. But I mean, isn't that really about respectability politics? So we can recognise, for instance, um, a march demanding better housing as mm -hmm. political, mm -hmm. whereas we might say that a riot which involves looting is just some kind of, you know, <laughs> feral outburst. And I feel that there's a bit of an overlap with maybe some of the pop cultural analysis that you mm -hmm. do in this book, because you talk about how your own attitude towards making music has changed. Your attitude towards um, celebration of violence has changed. Use of the N-word has changed. Mm -hmm. I think at one point in the book you say, no truly self-loving people can mm -hmm. celebrate their own death. Mm -hmm. um, is there at times a danger of sort of lapsing into uh, reinforcing a binary between so-called conscious and I guess Completely. unconscious rap mm -hmm. and then thinking about how that maps onto politics? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't, I don't see that separation. I mean, Tupac, is quite possibly the greatest gangster rapper of all time and the greatest conscious rapper of all time. I, I, and I don't see the celebration of violence, let's be clear, as an innate, uniquely black negative. Korean revenge cinema is very, very violent. Korea is a very peaceful country. Anyone, I can watch every Italian mafia film as I have done um, and not think, come out thinking that all Italian people are in the mafia. If people listen to rap music and it drives them to believe that every young black boy sells crack and shoots people, that's their own stupidity. That's not rappers' fault. And I think we're even seeing now, with Crepton Conan opening their ice cream shop, with gigs on his Instagram, spending more time on his Instagram posing with his daughter than anything else, right? We're seeing that what happens when young black men from the hood get some money, naturally it changes them. And not even in a negative way. When your material, so just in case it's not clear, when I was talking about my friends wanting to improve their material life, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's perfectly legitimate. Uh, desire in life, I suppose what I am saying, that doesn't mean that all poor people are Marxists is what is what is the point I was trying to make. Not that it's wrong for poor people to want the norms of middle class life. Who doesn't want to have a comfortable life? Who wants to spend 12 hours a day working and have nothing to show for it at the end of 50 years in the factory or wherever it may be? Um, but yeah, I definitely think another thing that's changed is as I've got older, I've felt that a lot of middle class black outrage, so-called gangster rap, for example, is more about middle class black people wanting to look respectable because every other culture celebrates violence. And if, if you're arguing that it's going to make us look bad, what you're doing is you're normalizing the white gaze. You're saying it's going to make us look bad to who? Middle class white people don't say, oh, you know, Danny Dyer makes us look bad, right? Do you see what I mean? So it's, it's still them refusing to interrogate why they think a white audience is not intelligent enough to know the difference between the black underclass and, and black people that are not part of the underclass, for example. But it's also a case of, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, things get, I guess, um, defanged. So what's interesting to me is that people who would have been terrified of NWA when they first came out are yeah. now praising NWA as yeah, conscious sure, rap. Right. Yeah. Similarly with gigs, I was reading this um, terrible article in The Telegraph about drill and suddenly gigs was being held up as this elder sensible statesman as if he, you know, hadn't caught what, one... Not... But even with, even with me, I think for a lot of middle class, this doesn't happen with young black boys. Mm. One of the reasons I'm respected, whether people like it or not, is everyone knows how I grew up and what I was on and what my friends were on. I'm not that as different from gigs as some people would like to believe. The difference is gigs went prison as a teenager and I didn't. Mm. I carried a knife as a teenager. My best friend used to steal his dad's gun from under the mattress and we was on the road. Like it, I'm not who they want to, might want to, it's easy. One of the reasons I confess to a lot of this stuff in the book, a lot of stuff my mum did not know, <laughs> right? And there's some stuff that we left out because we had to, right? But it's because I don't want people to put me on this pedestal as the unique Negro. Look at him, why can't you all be like him? I ain't that different fam. I am not suggesting that I'm in some innately moral, wonderful human. When my life was shit, or at least I felt it was shit, I behaved in some very shit ways. My life's good. I no longer behave in those ways. Neither does gigs. Gigs ain't going to go out on the road tomorrow and be like, you know what? Even though my life's great and I'm on tour and I'm very well off now, you know what would make this all better? Going back to prison. He's not, he's not dumb enough to make that decision. Do you know what I mean? I know him personally. So I don't think people should try and make this big separation. A Carla, the good black guy who reads all the books, isn't he wonderful? I was reading books when I was 15 and I was carrying a knife and I was in the black bookshop with my brethren and my oldest. So it's, it's um, yeah, one of, the, one of the main points I'm trying to make is that I am not that different from these young boys out here. In fact, ironically, 
there's loads of black boys I grew up with who weren't about this life. Mm. And me and my friends kind of looked at them as soft. And it's only when I got to 21, 22, where I was like, nah, I'm not on it no more. I'm not in it. And a lot of my brethren, I think, did say, right, like, you've lost it. Now, 10 years later, after 10 years of being in and out of jail, and, you know, one of my best friends got deported. He, he was in England since he was two. You know, he, he, was, he was a naughty lad. Um, people are saying, oh, actually, maybe you made a good decision, but I shouldn't be separated from other street black youths to make middle class people feel good. I'm not that different from them. I think that um, sense of a refusal to pander to the white gaze, I think either through sensationalising violence or through kind of, um, you know, rejecting it and separating yourself off was something that really came across um, in the book to me. The other thing that came across was just how very, very British it is, and in particular, very, very North London, which absolutely made my heart sing. So I've got two questions for you yeah. um, on that. One, why is it that all you Ackland Burley boys were such heartbreakers growing up? <laughs> no, I ain't, I ain't taking credit for the rest of them. I don't, I don't know. Oh my it. God, no, you 100% were. It would take like, an Ackland Burley boy would like completely fuck your heart up and you would need like, Northumberland Park boy to fix it. That was how it was. Northumberland Park? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, them, yeah. them man was way worse than we were. I'm not having that. <laughs> no, no, I'm no. not having that. And that no, was because the yeah. Ackland Burley boys were like a little bit hipster, so they'd mess you around a bit more. Yeah, maybe, but but that wasn't my... I can't take... Burley was a much more mixed school than, say, Northumberland Park or DNK or... So I can't... My set was... I spent much more of my childhood in, you know, Tottenham or Hackney or Halsden than I did in Camden. This is one of the things I talk about in the book. In a weird way, it's like I gravitated to where my cousins lived and where my friends lived because of that sort of isolation of, yeah, going to a school with a lot of middle-class white kids and poor white kids, but then getting to a point in my mid-teens where I felt like I could no longer relate and sort of like self-ghettoising and then kind of vacating Camden for Tottenham. I mean, and the, I, guess, I guess the other thing I wanted to ask about that is um, because it feels so rooted in North London, so rooted in a British diaspora experience, mm. do you ever think that as anti-racists in this country, we're a bit too reliant on an American model of understanding racism? I, I very much, I think for African Caribbeans in particular, and I've only started to realise this in the last five years, that can be one of the dangers. We love our black American cousins. Malcolm is on the wall, Martin is on the wall, Mohammed is on the wall. Um, but in a way, the British state has encouraged that. Think about how many great documentaries the BBC have done on the civil rights movement, on Malcolm X, on Martin Luther King. And almost a way of saying, look at these wonderful black Americans and look how racist America is and look how much they've done over their black people. You talk to most black people in Britain even, they'll know the Alabama church bombing. They won't know New Cross. And so one of the points I'm trying to make in this is not that that's wrong that we know about our, what, what's happened in America. It's the center of the empire. It's the center of world politics at, at the moment, or at least believes it is. Um, but one of the dangers is sort of othering the British struggle and that being sort of a secondary, of secondary importance. So I do think it's very, very important that we are as familiar with Stuart Hall as we are with Toni Morrison or Angela Davis. And at the moment we're not. We, we all know a Toni Morrison or Angela Davis, but we won't know a Stuart Hall or a Gilroy or a Gus John or a Claudia Jones. And those are equally important because our situation, as I've said, is quite different. Uh, very similar but also very, very different. What are the specific things that you think make the British situation different? Well, the lack of formal apartheid. It meant that the British government had to try and achieve the outcomes of apartheid without having those legal mechanisms of, of, of actual segregation. Um, and, and never really actually aimed to achieve the same things that America had. One of the things post-war British governments were really concerned about was the creation of actual black ghettos in, in Britain because they felt that was too troublesome. And so they did want a degree of assimilation. They didn't want to appear to be too racist. So they wanted to restrict Commonwealth migration on racial grounds, but then felt that the black people that were here, it would be too embarrassing to treat them as badly as they were being treated in America or Australia or Southern Africa. And so so that subtleness of British racism is why a lot of people think you're, you're going over the top when you say police battered people in my family. People think you're just making it up to sound cool. Um, but if they talk to Irish people over 50, they'll find a, a similar stories. In fact, the Irish story in a way in post-war Britain shows exactly what I'm talking about. The Irish in America by then had very much become white. They were not really accepted until the mid 90s after the Good Friday Agreement. When I was growing up, Irish people in Kilburn, getting battered by the police was still very, very normal. And so it's all of those different nuances, but mainly the fact of living in a neighborhood that is not segregated. My business partner is from Vanderveer Projects in New York. Um, and when she grew up, there were literally zero white people in her neighborhood or in her class. In fact, zero non-black people. There is nowhere in Britain that is quite like that. Maybe Handsworth, maybe. And that's Caribbean and Asian even. Do you see what I mean? So it's not even like, there is nowhere where there's that complete level of spatial segregation. Um, and that just creates a 
slightly different um, environment, a slightly different analysis, and also having that direct connection to the Caribbean or West Africa, to majority black polities, is very different from being essentially isolated in America and severed from, even though there's been migration from the Caribbean into America, um, severed from those connections to those places. Um, and so there, there, are, there are similarities, but there are big, there are big, big differences that I think ha have to be wrestled with. And now we're coming more of cultural confidence. None of this is di divorced from popular culture. Now we're coming more into our own. Um, I think we're going to start analysing those things even more. One final question. Mm -hmm. The year is 2022. Yep. We have a Labour government. I'm off in Ibiza somewhere getting munted. And Prime Minister Jeremy Corbyn approaches you and says, you can suggest one single policy to significantly improve the conditions of people of colour in this country. What would you offer up? Probably what I would suggest, and I'll just say this publicly now because it is what it is, but I've been, um, I've been working with lots of different groups of young people for, for a while um, in the ends um, and trying to look at what solutions there can be to some of the you know, problems with serious youth violence and things of that nature. Um, and one of the things that keeps coming up is this idea of setting up community-run boarding schools. And so the logic for that is very, very simple. Despite what we're reading in the press, so for example, in, in London, the percentage of black people in London that actually kill someone in any given year is less than 0.005%. Yeah, so there's over a million black people in London, there's always less than 50 murders in, in the community. So actually, even though there are definitely big problems, it's interesting the way those are being spun as if blackness is a sufficient common denominator. What's happening is the underclass within the black underclass is being used as a weapon against the people who are the primary victims of their crimes. The other 99% of black people who don't kill anybody are being held ethnically responsible. 47% of all the people in Britain's prisons were expelled from school as children. 24% were in the care system at some point. So the British government, the state, the Department for Education, the police themselves, if you read their own reports, understand very, very well what the common denominators are and what the predictors are for crime or later attraction to violent crime. That's as true in Glasgow or Liverpool as it is in London. So the rationale was saying, well, if these young boys who get expelled at 12 end up in a PRU and then end up causing problems later on, if they were removed and put on a farm in Cambridge, but with people who understand them, I don't mean middle-class yeah. missionaries. I mean, the man them go out to Cambridge with them, <laughs> olders, train them, you know, you swim in the lake, you get that. What it does, it achieves two things, is the argument. It, on the one hand, it um, tries to work with the group most at risk of causing problems, going to jail, being violent, etc. And the other hand, the other 99% of kids in Hackney or Tower Hamlets or Brixton or wherever else, who actually just want to go to school and get their grades and get a job despite being poor, they're freed from the burden of of the young people who've been less fortunate than them, not just economically, but in terms of their family circumstance and everything else. So that would probably be, yeah, I think, I think that would probably be the policy that I would suggest. It seems remarkably solution. fleshed out considering I just like chucked this question at you out of nowhere. No, it's been something I've been thinking about quite a lot. Now, look at it like this. It's significantly more expensive to send a kid to prison than it is to send them to Eton. So we're perfectly fine to subsidise young poor kids to be in the countryside. We just prefer they were in the countryside in a prison. Um, and so even for people on the right, I'm, I'm expecting, hopefully, when you know, these ideas get suggested, lots of support mm -hmm. on the grounds that it's economically more efficient, if nothing else. Um, and so, yeah, that, 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 the money is there and, 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 and the, it's whether the political will is there to say we'd rather repair the damage than, than add to it. If, they, if you've got a larger prison population, you've got more people growing up with parents in prison, you've got more people who go to prison. And Britain, incidentally, has the largest prison population in the whole of Western Europe right now, and we've got people who want to grow it. So that is probably the main solution I would suggest to achieving many of those outcomes, saving the taxpayer money, lowering uh, serious youth violence, stopping allowing the black underclass being used as a weapon against the other 99% of black people, promoting education. There are so many things that we feel a policy like that properly implemented, not as a means to spy on young people, which is what it could end up being used for, but as a means to seriously work with young people um, and, re and repair some of the various damages that are in their life is the policy we, we would, I would suggest. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. No, it's been wonderful to have you. Um, and yeah, Prime Minister Jez, get on it.